sat down to watch it yesterday and I've absolutely fallen in love with it. So congratulations. Oh, you're my hero. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I think what I love about this movie is the way you capture Thailand. I spend a lot of time in Thailand because I also work for the Phuket News, um, a newspaper oh, over really? there. Yeah, and the way you capture Thailand is just so magical in this film. So I was wondering if you could start off by telling us a little bit about where this idea came from for you in the first place. Yeah, i um, happy to. Um, it was a sort of a weird journey because, um, as you may or may not know, I've done a lot of uh, genre films, like horror films, teen comedies, um, yep. um, that sort of thing, uh, action stuff. And um, I went to Bangkok initially to do a kind of a, a horror thriller. And, you know, the city and all the, you know, the the sleazy underbelly of a big, big cosmopolitan city like that. And, and the producer was this wonderful um, uh, Thai lady named Cheryuan Tavoranon. And um, in one quiet moment, I remember we just sat talking about, you know, other things. And she told me about her life growing up in the north of Thailand, you know, near the Cambodian border and tiny little ink spot of a village and and what they did for fun and recreation and and one of these things was uh racing water buffaloes which is you know being there is is the staple of of agrarian life there yep and and um it just sounded insane i mean these things run as fast as as horses do on the sprint it's like you're on top of a stampede hanging on for dear life no, you know, nothing but, but the nape of the neck to grab onto. And, uh, and if you fall off, you're trampled. And, uh, you know, good luck having an adult life there at that point. And I was just, I was sort of flabbergasted, and it was an alien sport to me. I'd never heard of it. Um, but it, it occurred to me, wouldn't this be a really fun milieu to retell a, a, a kind of a favorite um, style of, of American story, which is the National Velvet, Sea Biscuit, kind of luckless, you know, person who comes out of nowhere and wins their life back. And um, um, so I decided I, w- I would find myself an avatar, which uh, turned out to be a 13 year old LA girl who was, you know, uh, emotional issues and and basically exiled by her stepfather to just get out of his hair and send send her to a, her grandmother in northern Thailand and she's basically dropped down into the middle of this alien world yeah and ha- try to survive and how much of what the surprises and that that she sees also mirrored the surprises that you got because I learned very quickly that you never know what you're going to see around the next corner in Thailand. I remember my first day there, we went for a drive up to a temple that was up on this mountain. And the first corner we went around, there's a group of kids sitting on the back of an elephant. And for a naive Australian, that was a really, really weird sight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is. It, it, you know, I've done a lot of films where we deal with aliens and monsters from other places and landing on other lands and out of the earth experiences, but this was a real out of, out of our, uh, familiar settings experience. And, and it was, it, my journey very much mirrored hers because I felt like I was deliberately dropped into the, uh, middle of a completely alien universe and trying to, to cope and finding very much that all the, all of my preconceived assumptions were, um, thrown out the window that they have this was a thai crew thai cast thai language essentially uh some american um bookends but um once you're in thailand uh you're in thailand yep and um so i don't speak thai and i was communicating a lot by sign language and gesture and that sort of third way that you communicate when you connect with people and that really was also what the the story was about as you know the two lead kids are mute in different ways 
and for different reasons, but it was both a meaningful part of the character for me and also an artifice that let me really make a silent movie. Yeah. Um, I have to ask, because we have a lot of film young filmmakers that listen to this show, what are the biggest challenges of shooting in another country? You mentioned language being a big barrier there, but what are some of the other challenges or barriers that you met filming in an entirely different country? You know, it's all an attitude. I find I've, I've done this before, shooting uh, in a different country with a different language and if you just kind of subvert yourself a little bit um, and go with the flow of how communication can work between people who don't speak the same language I mean people get married when they don't speak each other's language they find this third communication device and um, so it's just be flexible on all levels. Be flexible with accommodations. Be flexible with the way of doing things. Uh, ties, you know, um, they don't have all of the bells and whistles that American crews have, but they're still amazing. I, I, I had a DP who um, could lay Dolly track down, had no wedges or anything. He used paperback books. And on one shot, which worked out brilliantly, but because of space and, and other limitations, he was the, the camera operator, the focus puller, and with his left leg, propelled the dolly <laughs> on, on the shot. And I'm like, he took three guys' jobs away. Yeah. And, and it was beautifully executed. And I go like, okay, I'm glad I shut my mouth up and didn't like make fun of him because it was a completely absurd thing to look at from my perspective but instead of like saying you know don't bother i let him do it and it was perfect yeah the other thing i also noticed about thai people is they're so friendly and so accommodating as well is that something that you found throughout the entire shoot always always and what it does do it it places the onus back on you you know we all lose sight in anybody who's making a film of like the film is everything you have to get get your day you have to get all shots at whatever cost and that's easy to do in america because if you like go past a certain hour or past a lunch break or past a certain level of comfort you'll hear about it yeah and if you do it twice they'll say okay you do that one more time and we're walking out and so you learn the you have guardrails in america but when everybody is so nice and everybody is so accommodating, um, you have to be both the the instigator and the adult in the room going, uh, this is too dangerous or too oppressive. I just can't do it. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a hard temptation for a director, especially because you want to press every envelope, you know? Definitely, yeah. And I guess the other big question that a lot of the filmmakers out there might be asking as well, as you mentioned before we know you for your work in the genre uh, filmmaking side of things what was it like going over and doing a coming of age story was there anything that you noticed was a a big difference in the way that you went about things or is it just is it just all the same at the end of the day it isn't and it goes back to the writing process for any of you who are actually uh screenwriters and and aspiring screenwriters is for me, there's two processes with, with screenwriting, and I wrote this as well as directed it. Um, there's stories that grow out of plot and stories that grow out of character. And most of the genre films are plot-driven. Like every five minutes, somebody's got to do something that, that you know creates tension or, or what one of my bosses always used to say is called lift-off, you know, like the shock gags. And... and and other, other tropes that are just rife throughout the, the, the genre world. And um, and then the characters have to bend to that. Like, like well, I've just been running for, like, a, you know, 45 minutes and there's a monster chasing me. Do I really have to take a shower now? Um, or a nap? So that, or am I really going to go into the... Um, the garage with all the chainsaws swinging from the ceiling you know it's just that thing yeah where you 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 bend the character you force them into these square holes with round pegs because you have to you have to get to the point where they're all left with the three survivors 
you know, back to back and and whatever threats surrounding them. Um, and most of the time, you can't let any of them live if it's a good horror movie. But, yep. <laughs> um, but here, the character, like, I was constantly going, the character wouldn't do that. The character would be driven to this and not that. And it was helped even more so by the actress that we, we ultimately picked, who was not an actor um, and was basically just a truant kid who had stopped by a, a, a casting um, audition um, up in, I think, Chiang Rai. Um, I saw her uh, on tape when I was still back in the States, but she was just doing it because she just didn't want to be in school. And she was so much the girl in our story that I didn't care if she had never any acting experience. Just seeing her talk about herself in front of the camera for five minutes, I knew she was mirroring the same story. And so I could really track the story along her own natural instincts as a director. Yeah. I, I was going to ask that. Tell us a little bit about Lily because she is absolutely fantastic in this film and she carries this film for most of the film. Tell us a little bit about, you've told us a little bit about how she got the role, but what was it about her that made her perfect for this role and what was she like to work with, especially considering that she was a rookie actress? Um, well, one of the joys in my career um, as much and sometimes more than the, the, the films that I've done is the talent that both in front and behind the camera that I've been a party to help move along and move up the ladder and some of which have way surpassed whatever I've, I've done or aspired to do. And that's, that's, that's like being a parent. That's really just an, a, a, a measure of pride. And I have that same pride of picking her out of a, just a bunch of, of other talented people, but the one who is the most raw and undeveloped talent. And at the end of, I mean, she had no impression of herself ever being an actress, I think, until she walked into that audition. And at the end of it, that was what she wanted to do with her life. Yep. Um, and, and, um, and she has the talent to do it. I, you know, one of the things you owe people is be honest enough to tell them, you know, you, you may want it really, really badly, but it's not for you, but it is for her. Uh, she, um, she lives half the year in Australia. Um, I think, uh, around Perth, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. And, um, um, divides her time because I think, um, you know, she just spent, spent some time in Thailand with her quirky grandmother, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, which is, uh, uh, just a coincidental aspect of the movie that the same thing happened. And um, um, those parallels were essential when I, when I started getting into the movie that here is, here's a, a soul that was, was almost just dropped out of the sky to be this, this character. And, um, and then not to give her a single bit of dialogue to express herself was another just challenge and only working with other children and animals another ch challenge um and she aced them all i was just and and yes the the nice thing about getting somebody that young and that inexperienced is they're not demanding they they'll work all day long there was one time when i sent her running through the woods and there were like brambles or something and she got all cut up and she goes like i want to do that again do i have to do that again and i go you know what let's not cut you up again. Let's, let's do something else. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but again, that's the whole thing. You have to be the, you have to restrain yourself when people are so cooperative. Definitely. Well, Joel, again, to finish off, I just want to say congratulations on making one of my favorite movies of this year. It's an amazing film. And what would you like to say to everybody out there before they sit down and watch this amazing film? I want to say that Dave Griffith says that this is the, his favorite movie and how could you not want to see it with that kind of recommendation? But it is, um, it's coming out, um, in North America, at least I, I, I'm not sure how all these platforms work anymore, whether, whether some of them are global and some of them are, are, are 
country to country. Um, but look for it. It's called My Best Worst Adventure. And I think if you QWERTY into your TV with your little remote thing or talk into it if you can or however you hashtag your way into the film, you'll find it and watch it because it's the one I'm most proud of, I think, in my entire career. Definitely.